My name's Colin Bicknell, I'm one of the consultant vascular surgeons at Imperial College London. I'm here with Matt Thompson, Professor of Vascular Surgery from St George's Vascular Institute, also in London. We're discussing the EVAS Forward Registry, which uh, assesses the Nelix aneurysm sealing device. So Matt, you're discussing the uh, registry to th at this conference in 2015. Can you tell us about the features of the registry and some of the first results? Okay, thanks Cole. So, I presented this yesterday in the Endologic Symposium uh, in the main auditorium. So the Global Registry is a 300 patient registry uh, enrolled since September 2014 at 30 centres around uh, Europe and in New Zealand. And it's really the first serious attempt to get some prospective, high quality, robust data on the performance of the Nelix Endograft. Um, some of the features that we should probably outline are that the registry started very early after the commercialization of the graft. Uh, it started after 200 patients had been implanted. So it's a very early experience of Nalix and as such represents some of the learning points of the technology as well as some of the learning curves that the physicians that implanted the graft went through. Uh, in broad summation, we presented results up to about a year of follow-up with, I think, encouraging aspects to the performance of the device. So in particular, um, there were no late aneurysm-related deaths. The rate of reintervention was 7% of a year, broadly equivalent to industry standard. And I think given where we started from in the registry, it's a very encouraging aspect to the early evaluation of this device. So what other studies are currently supporting the notion that EVAS may be the next gold standard? Yes, so you're quite right. EVAS uh, may represent a paradigm shift in aneurysm repair. And so before that becomes universally applicable, we're going to need some really high quality data to try and evaluate the performance of the graph. So with the EVAS Global Registry, we've got 300 patients enrolled and there is a plan to start re-enrolling in that registry in 2016, probably up to a further 300 patients, which will give us 600 patients prospectively evaluated. In addition to that, the company are pursuing uh, an IDE study in the United States, so that's 180 patients, all enrolled on label, which is a big difference to the global registry, which was all comers and the sites that have enrolled in the global, uh, in the IDE study, will have continued access to the device. And overall, that's probably going to give somewhere in the region of 900 to 1,200 patients in four year or five years time, which will represent, I think, a considerable registry evaluated prospectively with core lab evaluation, looking at the performance of the graph. So that should be on a par with industry standard, I would think. So EVAS is trying to address some of the problems we have with endoleaks. Yeah. But these endoleaks are still appearing. They are. Why are they? Yes. And I think part of that is what we discussed a little while ago about the design of the registry. So firstly, uh, the registry started in a very early clinical experience. So only 200 commercial cases before we went into a prospective evaluation. I think a lot of the centres were still really at the very early stage of their learning curve with the procedure. And actually, I think up until about a year into the registry, we were still trying to define broadly what a good procedure looked like, how to evaluate these patients afterwards, how to diagnose and manage any endoleak. So I think learning curve played a role. There were some technological improvements in the device in terms of manufacturing. Again throughout the course of the registry, which I think would impact again on the registry findings if we started it now. And I think one of the other issues with regard to the endoleaks in the study is that when you looked at the complexity of the patients, they're really quite a challenging group of patients for aneurysm repair. If you compare it to, let's say, the Engage study or the GREAT study, which are the industry standards, I think, in terms of enrolment, they're a challenging aortic population. So far higher proportion of patients with short necks, a far higher proportion of patients with angulated aortas, and a far higher proportion of patients with very large iliac aneurysms. And of course, we know 
if we look at what predicts reintervention, it's the size of the aneurysm, the shortness of the neck, the degree of angulation, and also iliac ectasia. So broadly, I think this is, I think probably the most challenging patient population ever enrolled in a post-market study. But despite that patient population, yeah. the number of endoleaks compares very favorably to EVAR. Certainly the reintervention rate is very favorable. It's about 7% per year, which is broadly on a par one or two percentage points away from what we see with the big EVAR registries. And of course, let's not forget, people have got 20 years experience of EVAR, so we know what good looks like in terms of a procedure. In terms of endoleaks, there were some early endoleaks, uh, six type 1As uh, in the 300 patients. And we think if you retrospectively analyze those, four or five, undoubtedly due to learning curves, so low implantation of the device and underfilling of the ender bags, which of course uh, is a novel technique that none of us have a great deal of experience with. Um, there were also four late endoleaks. Uh, again, many of those probably technique related, but of course there will be failure modes with the Nelix endovascular graft as there are with any grafts. I think encouragingly, however, we do have a treatment methodology for type 1 endoleaks, onyx, coil embolization, and certainly none of the patients who had a successful reintervention had an aortic related problem in the longer term. Clearly, Colin, it's early days, only out to a year, time will tell. What about adverse events? Any of those in the registry? There were um, three um, occlusions, uh, limb occlusions or Nelix limb occlusions that needed reinterventions, all within 30 days, none late. Um, if anything, uh, catches the eye in terms of reintervention and adverse events. It's the number of patients who got converted to open surgery. So we're not used to seeing that in our experience with EVAR. We did, I think, in the very early days of EVAR. There were six conversions in the 300 patients. Uh, one was due to a lock wire issue, so that's a technical manufacturing defect that has been corrected. Uh, one was due to uh, what was said to be an adverse appearance. Uh, which again uh, may reflect relatively early um, experience with the device. Two of the patients ruptured uh, after non-treatment of endoleaks, so there's two lessons there. One is if you have an endoleak, you need to treat it. And then there were two infections, and I think they're perhaps the ones that deserve comment. Uh, one patient had an aortoduodenal fistula, but actually uh, on analysis it was there beforehand. Um, so that was always going to get, get infected. And there was one Nelix graft that appeared to have an infection in the prosthesis that was removed. You talk about all-cause mortality. I, I gather it's 100% survival at 30 days and 96% survival at one year. Not quite, not quite correct. Um, there were three perioperative deaths right. um, within a 30-day period. So two pneumonias and a GI bleed. Mm. So that would give us uh, essentially a 1% um, aneurysm-related mortality. And that was the aneurysm-related mortality at 12 months. So 1%, no late aneurysm-related deaths. Uh, in terms of all-cause mortality, of course, we know from our randomized studies in the UK and elsewhere, and also the registry data, that elderly sick patients with aneurysms have a relatively high all-cause mortality. Uh, in most of the studies, that can be between 8 and 10 percent. Interestingly, in the global registry, it was 4 percent. So is that a numbers thing? It may well be. Will we see some catch-up late mortality? Again, we may do. But actually, if the curve continues at the present rate, only a 4 percent all-cause mortality per year will be very different to most other studies, and that would really need to be investigated and understood. You presented some cases where Nelix is used in juxta renal aneurysms. Yeah, yeah. Is this going to be a big thing for Nelix? It may be. Um, I presented yesterday on uh, some chimney cases, so the use of polymer-based technology to perform chimneys. I think we're all aware of the opportunities that exist in the juxta renal space. Open surgery we know has a high mortality. We know that 50% of cases may not be suitable for standard custom-made fenestrated grafts, and so people are exploring and experimenting with chimney procedures. I've never been a great fan of chimneys with conventional 
bifurcated graphs, I think, how can two circles seal? But the results are reasonable. Um, we've investigated the use of a polymer-based technology using Nalex to try and surround our chimney graphs in the juxtarenal aortic neck. We've done around 30 cases, and actually our results are pretty good at the present time. We think across Europe there's possibly 120 cases of chimneys, and what we're going to do is we're going to collect that experience and present what we think is a European experience on that, maybe at Charing Cross next year, who knows. What about the thoracic aorta? Have been used there? Thoracic aorta, certainly I have no experience of, uh, and I'm really unsure of the pipeline to the thoracic aorta, so um, I guess we both watch this space. So I'll finish with a couple of general questions. Yeah. What's been the highlights from Charing Cross 2015 for you? Well, Charing Cross is, of course, always a highlight of our year, Colin, isn't it? Um, it's been as busy as it ever is. Certainly the main auditorium is full. Um, the two new bits that have, uh, I've, I've experienced this year actually, I think, have really contributed to the meeting. So uh, the recorded Aortic Live Cases session was lively. There was great discussion. Uh, we learned lots of techniques. Uh, and actually, I like the abstract sessions as well. That's been busy, um, and it's given uh, a lot of junior guys the opportunity to present their research, which I think is hugely beneficial to their future development. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for giving up your time, Matt. Thank you very much, Colin. Thank you very much.